we're so um, glad to be working with these four ladies on stage with us today. Um, I kid you not, we're sitting with a journalist, an Air Force veteran, and two CIA intelligence analysts. It's amazing, these women, I get mad and I get up and I watch TV and I check Twitter and I'm so angry, but then I get up and I go to work because I get to work with these women every day and it is nothing short of inspiring. So let's kick it off. Um, I wanna hear from each of you on why now? Why did you decide to step up and run for office in 2018? Um, Abigail, do you wanna start? Sure. So my name is Abigail Spanberger, and I'm running in Virginia's 7th Congressional District. That's a seat currently held by uh, Congressman Dave Brad, a member of the House Freedom Caucus. And I decided to run. It was a bit of an evolution. Um, but I ultimately decided to run because I believe that we need leaders who are committed to understanding the challenges facing their district and committed to finding real long-lasting solutions to those challenges. Um, and I do not think that we should have people in Washington who are using the voice of an elected leader to advocate for policies that hurt people and are detrimental. And given my background with CIA, I was a case officer with the CIA, I had the particular experience of listening to our incumbent talk about the travel ban as a really valid, strong way of uh, addressing terrorist threat. And given my background in intelligence and working counterterrorism cases, I knew that what he was saying was not just wrong, but it was also really dangerous to our counter uh, counterterrorism efforts. And so for me, that was really what started me thinking about, you know, here's a person who's using his voice um, in a really detrimental way, and we need people who are just committed to finding solutions, um, and that's what got me started towards running, and, you know, there are a lot of things along the way that really motivated me, but that was the, the real start. Yes? Okay, great. Um, I'm Melissa Slotkin. I'm running in uh, Michigan's 8th District. Um, Mike Bishop is the incumbent there um, on Ways and Means for folks who know him. And I decided to run um, for one broad reason and one very specific reason. The broad reason is I'm from a service family. Um, I was 14 years in national security, CIA, and then the Pentagon. I did three tours in Iraq. My husband's career army officer, and I have two stepdaughters in service, one um, who's a physician for the VA and one who's a brand new army officer. So I just think fundamentally, um, I've worked for both Democrats and Republicans. I worked in the Bush White House. I worked in the Obama White House. What's going on now is different and fundamentally unbecoming of the country that we served um, and the country that we all love. So that was the broad reason, but the thing that pushed me into it because running for office is a um, strange thing to do when you haven't been planning that your whole life, um, was health care. And um, the health care vote last May, very specifically, the live Rose Garden ceremony um, carried on CNN, you know, carried on all the stations. Um, my mom died of ovarian cancer in 2011, and when she was diagnosed, she did not have health care. She had let it lapse um, and struggled with health care her whole life. So when I saw the man I'm now running against um, in sort of the fourth or fifth row behind Paul Ryan. Um, he had not had one town hall or one engagement with people at all, all spring, and he was smiling and beaming and proud that he had voted to repeal health care with no plan. Um, something just broke. Um, I turned to my husband and I said, that's dereliction of duty in our world. That is a fireable offense. And so we've been working on firing him. That's great. Jana. I'm Jana Lynn Sanchez, and I'm running for U.S. Congress in District 6 of Texas. That's the seat that was held by Joe Barton for 34 years. Um, he's retiring now, so it's an open seat. Um, I never once in my life thought about running for any kind of office. Um, the morning of November 9th, um, I hadn't slept all night, and um, I, just, I asked a question to a friend who's in the audience, actually, Holly Page. Um, I said, what can I do? I said, I'm very concerned about the anti-immigrant rhetoric. My grandfather came from Mexico. He was what today we refer to as an undocumented immigrant. Um, and I really didn't like the way that the conversation was going in America. And Holly said, you have to run for office. You have to be part of the solution. Um, and I didn't really know what that meant, and I just did some research, and I thought this district looked very winnable. Um, and it was the only district I lived in that was winnable because I live in the very Republican part of a winnable district. Um, so I decided to run for Congress, and I saw that lots of other women were doing it as well, and I became part of that movement. And I think I see my mission is to help fix America. That's great. Um, thank you. 
And I can't wait to hear from Chrissy. Chrissy was one of the first candidates of 2018 that reached out to Emily's list. She sent an email to us um, with her resume attached and said, what do you think? <laughs> and we said, hell yeah. <laughs> Is this, is this on? Uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's a true story. Not only was it an email, but I hit reply to one of those solicitations that I get every day for a dollar to Emily's list and attached my resume and just assumed that it was going to the ether and I would never hear anything. And I got a call. So that, that was pretty cool. Um, my name is Chrissy Houlihan. I'm running for Congress just outside of Philadelphia in the western suburbs in the 6th Congressional District. It is a redistricted district as a result of reapportionment. Uh, but my current uh, congressman is Representative Ryan Costello. It is now an open seat, uh, and this is a deeply purple place uh, in terms of our sensibilities as a people. Um, I'm running for Congress similar to all the other women on the stage for a lot of different reasons, um, some big and some small. By way of my background, also an unintended uh, candidate, did not expect to be doing this in a million years. Um, my background is I'm an engineer, I'm a vet of the U.S. Air Force, I'm third generation military in my family. I'm also an entrepreneur and most recently I've been focused on the uh, engagement in early childhood literacy, uh, running a nonprofit that focuses on that. So mine is also a career of service in my opinion and I really am kind of one of those private introverted people who never expected to be sitting on this stage. Uh, but I was really compelled to run for office and to hopefully use my skills on our behalf because of November 6th, uh, I'm sorry, 8th of, November, uh, of 2016, which was a really dark day in my, my life. Um, the next morning, my daughter, who had come home to vote with me, is now 26 years old, uh, was in tears, uh, despondent. She's gay, um, and she wouldn't leave our home, you know, to go back to her adult life for the better part of a week because she was so undone by what we had just said to each other about people like her. And my dad, who I mentioned is a career naval officer, also happens to be a Holocaust survivor. Uh, and when he visited us that, that week following the election, he also sat and cried with me in the living room talking about his concern for the nation that he had grown up in and served uh, and his worry that we were once again going to have to build out our basements and hide people. Uh, and those two generations in the military with, that I worked in, uh, satellite imagery was a big deal, were validation, something called dual phenomenology. When your two satellites are telling you the same thing, it's ground truth. And when they were both telling me that we were in danger uniquely, uh, it really was a time, an action, a call to action for me. So that's why I'm running. That's great. Thank you, ladies. So each of these women is stepping up to run in some places in pretty tough turf, with traditionally pretty tough turf for Democrats. Chrissy has a brand new district. We're hoping that goes a little easier than we have in the past, but we can't take anything for granted. Um, but I want to hear particularly from Alyssa and from Jana, um, what are the issues that voters are talking about with you as you're out on the campaign trail and they're in your kind of lean red districts? Sure. So I think, um, as I think other folks have said here, the issues that come up routinely every single day in my district tend to be health care and the price of health care and the price of prescription drugs. Um, roads and infrastructure for us in Michigan, water and clean water um, is something we can't take for granted anymore. Um, and then money in politics, the sense that um, our system is bought and sold. Frankly, um, the sense that both parties are bought and sold um, and that people are uh, making decisions based on who their big donors are, not who the people on the ground really, or what the people on the ground really believe is important. Um, uh, I would say there's been two issues that have really broken through, um, national issues that have broken through the whole time. Um, and just by, by way of context, um, I ran the U.S.-Russia defense relationship for years at the Pentagon and negotiated with them on a monthly basis, um, but I had been asked about um, kind of meddling in our elections five times in a year um, uh, that I was running. Um, and then I've done more work on this summit that would just happen between Putin and President Trump. I've done more media, more talking about national security in the past week than I have in the past year. So that summit and then the separation of children um, at the border were the two issues that broke through where national issues dominated house parties, events, town halls. Um, otherwise, it's people's pocketbooks or their kids and what we are going to do to help them with both. Um, and if you're not talking about what you're going to do to help them with both in the next six months, you're just not talking to them. Yeah, that's right. That's right. What about you, Jenna? Um, very similar 
um, obviously health care is a huge issue and that crosses over party lines. Um, immigration reform is a big issue and in particular the issue of family separation has been a lightning rod for a lot of independents to say they're not voting Republican. That has been an issue. Um, education and the funding of education is a major issue, although it's mainly a state issue. When you go to someone's door, they don't necessarily understand the difference between state, local, and federal issues, but th the fact that you're there talking about it is very important. Um, so, and that's, that benefits a Democrat in a state that's been run by Republicans badly for a long time. Absolutely. Um, Abigail and Chrissy, uh, you're running in very different districts. Um, what do voters in your district think the Democratic Party stands for? We've had that conversation a lot over the last couple of days. And, and how has their perception of what the Democratic Party is helped you or been challenging for you on the campaign trail? So I live in a district that's historically, we haven't had a Democrat uh, in this seat since 1971. We're a long-term Republican seat. And we haven't really had active Democratic involvement across our 10 counties. Uh, we have moved the seat from a safe Republican, solid Republican to a toss-up district because people are now engaged. But people are actually asking this question a lot. And so people will ask me, well, what is the Democratic Party doing? Or they'll say, well, I don't want the Democratic Party to just focus on being anti-Trump. People say, I just want the party to be for something. Um, and, and that's people who identify as Democrats, people who identify as independents who are looking for a reason to you know, direct their vote towards a Democrat. And, and I spend a lot of time on the campaign trail talking about, I mean, the same thing for us. It's healthcare, it's education, it's infrastructure, particular to our district, broadband internet infrastructure and road infrastructure. Um, and much like Alyssa's experience, suddenly people do want to talk about Russia, but I mean, the past, for the past year, it's been those issues that impact people, impact their ability to ensure that their families are safe, their economic stability is there, and their children are going to have opportunities moving forward. Um, and and so where we can, as a party, can really have definable messaging that people can, can remember and can carry with them, I think that there's so much opportunity, particularly in districts from, like mine, where it's not just, oh, that Democrat is saying that, but people feel that that's what's emanating out of the party in a larger, um, a larger view. I don't want people to think she's a different type of Democrat. I want people to think she's representative of all of them, and I'm now proud to be a Democrat. Yeah, so I completely agree with what, what you were just saying. Um, our district is still, even in its redistricted form, 50% Democrat, 50% Republican. It is a district that Hillary won, but also that uh, Senator Toomey also won on the very same day. So we are a people who vote on the exact same day for both red and for blue. And I believe that our people are really genuinely a purple people. Um, that I don't think it's really a bunch of folks who are R's and a bunch of folks who are D's. I think that we solidly, as human beings, sit in the middle in terms of our sensibility. And so in terms of the issues that we talk about, exactly the same, health care, education, opportunity and jobs for everyone. Uh, we definitely, as Democrats, uh, try to not talk about President Trump in, in sort of the negative forms of talking about it because that's not what people want to hear. You know, they want to hear about how you're going to solve problems and how you're going to bring your solutions to Washington on their behalf. Uh, and so I think that it's been remarkable to see the contrast. I used to live in Boston, uh, where in Boston you'd see yard signs everywhere, at, you know, before elections, you know, they'd be littering the landscape. Here in my community, we're very private about our, our political affiliation, about our religious affiliation. And we're starting to see people sort of on the Republican side, on the independent side, beginning to move towards the Democratic message because it's the right message. It's the message of, of the middle class. It's the message of the people. Um, so a fun one. Um, would each of you tell us what is the most interesting question you've gotten from a voter on the campaign trail? <laughs> I can answer that one. <laughs> Where are you on dear contraception? <laughs> uh, that was one. And yeah, the other really one was different person. Where are you on fox hunting? I think your voters are much more interesting than mine. <laughs> um, I, I'm afraid the, the question that comes up a lot, maybe it's not the most interesting, is about abortion. It still remains an issue. It's a tough issue in my district, um, and I just answer it truthfully. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's a, a question. The most interesting phenomenon is the number of Republican-leaning, right now our fastest growing category of volunteer are Republican women over 55 in the suburbs of Detroit. Um, and yeah, we're very proud of that. 
And there are a tremendous number of women who don't tell their husbands what they're doing. And they won't give us their home numbers, right? Because they don't want to bring politics home with them. Um, I know of at least two book clubs that are not real book clubs. They're, um, and, and, uh, and those women are extremely brave, right? A lot of them are lifelong Republicans, so we welcome them into our campaign. Um, but the questions I get um, from some of those volunteers about how to clandestinely support our campaign have been the most interesting, I would say. The answer is money orders. I've also answered that question. Um, <laughs> um, so I get asked all the time, so I have a question, I don't, I don't know if it's appropriate, but, and I know exactly where it's going when this comes up. Do, do you watch Homeland? Yes. All the time, all the time. Is, is that real? I'm like, I'm not bipolar. I'm not sleeping with a sleeper agent. All the time. Yep. <laughs> That's amazing. I say a little bit like it, minus all the in, um, instability yeah. and poor judgment. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so I asked that question to several of our candidates, and um, the uh, one answer that I got back was one of our candidates um, gets the question, do you plan on running as a woman? <laughs> Um, so will you all just talk with us a little bit about your experience being a woman candidate and how that has helped or been challenging to you this cycle? We were just talking about that thing backstage. There definitely is this narrative of like you're just your chromosomal composition uh, and you're only running because you're a woman and you have nothing else to offer the world other than your femininity. Um, but I think a lot of the challenges have actually been from women themselves uh, talking to you about there, there is constantly a woman who will pull you aside and say, nobody else would say this, but you know, you really shouldn't have open toed shoes, you know, or you have too many wrinkles or there's this constant conversation about your looks. Um, and so that is something that I'm pretty sure that my male opposition and opponent does not have to, to yeah. go through. I, I feel it's clearly an advantage to be a woman this year. You feel it both at the door when you're talking to voters. There are women who I've gone to their home to talk to them because they're in our persuadable universe and the husband won't let her speak and just keeps talking about uranium sales and things like that. And then the woman will just say, um, give me that card, I'm only voting for women. Um, and so, you know, I think women are really, even Republican women are definitely um, much more inclined to vote for a woman. There is a chromosomal advantage this year, I think, yes. I feel it very strongly in my district. I would also argue all of you are running incredibly strong campaigns, which is part of that, a major part of that. Yeah, um, I guess um, I, after so many years of working at CIA and the Pentagon and working in Iraq, like it's exciting to have being a woman be an advantage. Um, the, um, so we're thrilled. Um, but the, um, yeah, I think that uh, particularly again with swing voters and Republican leaning women, a lot of women will say, hey, you know, I don't consider myself a feminist, but I really believe in electing women. Um, and I believe that women will bring things, will get things done that they know how to problem solve, like that what is broken in Washington can only be fixed by a greater composition of women. And so whatever the kind of intent behind it, um, uh, I, I think it's an advantage this cycle, although as we were all just talking about backstage, maintaining the happy warrior um, sort of uh, persona, you know, you can't be just happy or just a warrior, you have to be the happy warrior, I think is something that is a constant fact in our lives, you have to um, be likable as well as tough. So I have three small children, three daughters under the age of 10, um, and that's been an interesting piece. And a lot of times people ask me about my kids um, and what my husband thinks about this. And at first I was really taken aback by it because I know that those are not questions that are asked of male candidates. But I actually now see it in a larger piece where I think people are trying to have a real personal connection. Um, because when I do answer the questions, a lot of times it gets followed up with like, oh, you're a mom, like you get it. And I never would have thought, and when we launched the campaign, I really try to keep my kids out of it. Um, 
but I actually now see that people are looking to kind of see me as a whole person, particularly as people feel so disconnected from politics. So I, I think it's actually an interesting piece where people are finding places to relate to me that I just didn't think were possible. Um, but again, you know, with the CIA background, people will ascribe certain things to that, and people will say to my husband, oh my goodness, she's, you know, she's gone all the time, and is that okay? And you know, he'll joke, well, a meet and greet in Chesterfield is not like traveling an alias and I don't know where, um, which kind of mitigates things a little bit. But um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, I think there's a lot of challenges and you get people sort of being critical and, and being really helpful with their advice, a lot of helpers. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that we have to deal with. But, you know, overall, I think it's absolutely an advantage because people are looking for something fuller, and for whatever reason, they're ascribing that to a lot of women candidates. Did you want to add something to that, Jenna? No. Oh, I saw you kind of. Okay. okay. Um, so about a month ago, I was in Virginia with Abigail, and um, a story came out while I was there that called her a willowy blonde and she's only gaining traction because she's a willowy blonde with CIA credentials. Um, but despite all of that and those challenges, uh, the next morning, um, Abigail invited me to speak at a women's breakfast. And I said, okay, this is great. I'm happy to show up to a women's breakfast. I showed up that morning at 7.30 in the morning and there were 100 angry, fired up, ready to work women at this breakfast and it was amazing. So, but this is a tough district, a traditionally pretty tough district for Democrats. So I want to hear from each of you, how do you balance tapping into that energy and those folks that are fired up and stepping into this process, not just as candidates, but as volunteers and donors and helpers? How do you tap into that energy while also making sure that you're not alienating folks that maybe voted for Donald Trump that you want to swing over, some of those swing voters in your district? I can, I'm happy to start. Yeah. Um, I think... Um, we felt really early on that, um, you know, you can't punish people for your vote, for their vote, and then expect them to vote for you. So what we um, say, which is I, I believe, I really believe in is, listen, like, I don't like the messenger, but I got your message, right? You, you sent a message that you were unhappy with Washington, that you felt unheard and underrepresented, and you wanted to change, and you'd rather take a disruptor of any kind rather than someone you saw as the status quo candidate. And I hear that, and I'm responding to that. Um, that is how we, we handle it in our district, um, because you can't punish people. Yeah. Right, absolutely. I think there's a, a false narrative, at least in the 6th Congressional District, and I think uh, in Pennsylvania, southeastern Pennsylvania, and possibly Delaware as a whole, at least in my experience, that there is this progressive part of the party, and there, there's this moderate part of the party, and we're at war with each other, and that we're, you know, fractionated and, you know, hate each other. I have not seen that in my district. I have seen pragmatists. I've seen people who really get that something was wrong. You know, I think Alyssa has a great analogy of this was a stage 4 cancer patient who just had nothing left to lose other than to take the, the poison pill in the form of President Trump. So I think our, our Democrats are, relatively speaking, very unified in understanding that we need to reach out and across the aisle. We need to reach out to independents and to Republicans because we need to solve this problem. And so we talk very positively in the campaign and at the doors to make sure that this is a message about jobs and opportunity, about education, not, and not about what's going on at the higher level in the administration. Yeah. So I meet people over there. I sense a really strong feeling about hopefulness, of hopefulness among my core base. Um, these are volunteers who come out, some of them work 40 hours a week for the campaign, walking precincts in 105 Amazing. degree heat. Um, the other ones write postcards or drive or do all kinds of other things, but they work really hard for the campaign. And what they tell me is, you are the. this is the first time in 30 years we've had any hope at all of taking this district. And because of that, I'm gonna, you know, I'm, and you listen to us, then we're gonna continue to support you. And then the people who they go talk to at the door are more the swing voters, of course, and they are a testament to that. So I, I go walk myself, but I feel sometimes the volunteers who are out there, who are part of the community talking to their fellow community members and giving them hope is really, is very helpful. So I don't feel a big divide between base and, and swing in that regard. People wanna be right. listened to. In, in our relatively historical or reflexively Republican district, I mean, I talk about where we're going, and I will frequently say, look, I did not vote for Donald Trump. I, I, 
I am not pleased with where we are, but it doesn't have to be about him. It has to be about where we are as a country and where we're going and how we're going to get there. And do we want to continue, continue with this level of obstructionism that we see, or do we actually want to see progress? And so I try to talk about him as little as possible because there are, even among the Democrats, people who are so upset about where we are, they don't watch the news, they're disengaged. Those people need hope. They need to know that working for something will get them something. And for people who voted for Trump because they thought he would be different or they thought he'd make a change or any of these other reasons, there's no reason to go back and make them feel guilty about a vote or make them question that vote or anything. It's moving forward. What is it that what we're going to do and how can we do it together? And that really resonates with a lot of our middle of the road folks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my background is in campaign management and I spent the last redistricting cycle at the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Um, and if you had told me in 2013 or 2012 even that inside of this decade, Democrats had a path to flipping the house inside of this decade on these maps, I would have chuckled at you a little bit. Um, but the, the world is on its head. These women are running tremendous campaigns in really in competitive districts. Um, at Emily's List, we've endorsed 54 women for the house and an amazing 41 of them are in districts currently held by Republicans, which means we can flip the house literally with women candidates alone. It's amazing, it's amazing. So I wanna hear from all of you who are running in stretch seats, tremendous campaigns. Um, I wanna spend our last two minutes um, with folks hearing from you on what is your path to victory? Who wants to go first? Uh, real quick, it's getting all of the Democrats who at one point in time have voted in a Democratic, uh, voted for a Democrat to come out and vote, convincing people, making people understand that we have a district-wide strategy, so no matter how red it feels where they are, we need to just lose a little bit less where they are and we're going to win <laughs> in other places. Um, and that seems to resonate. And then with people who are middle-of-the-road voters who at times have voted for a Democrat or haven't, um, it's about just making sure that the campaign is accessible, that people know who I am, that people know what it is that I'm working for um, and get people excited about the campaign and that's been our strategy kind of boiled down that we've been uh, following since the very beginning. That's great. So my strategy is almost exactly the same. Get out the Democratic vote. If all of us show up, that's helpful. It's not enough. Uh, making sure that we get out a very large, significant portion of our population is independent and not affiliated with a party. And then those 55-year-old women, who Republican women, who are super angry, making sure that they show up as well. And I agree with Abigail's point, which is the last thing is, is I'm a new candidate. I'm a neophyte. I'm unknown to everyone. Uh, and so making sure that people actually know who I am, that I'm a veteran, an engineer, you know, a businesswoman, an uh, educator, an entrepreneur, all of those things, not just that I'm a woman and that I'm a Democrat. Uh, and that's the last thing is to make sure that they actually know what they're voting for. I think um, we are running the first credible campaign in this district in more than three decades. And you really see the difference because, because of all the time we spend talking to voters at their door, I think that's really essential. We're, we are data focused. We do know who our voters are. We make sure we go out and we get their contact details. Um, we also raise money, which hasn't been done before. In the last election, the Republican had 500 times the amount of money that the Democratic um, challenger had. And now we're outraged our Republican opponent and we've been consistently outraising our Republican Congratulations. opponent. Congratulations. So it's, it really is just showing up and listening. Um, I would just say, I mean, I echo a lot of what folks have said. I think um, n not taking any voters for granted, right? I mean, we started knocking doors in the fall and we realized, oh, like this person was listed as likely Democrat, that is not a Democrat. And the person next door, you know, the person next door who we thought we had listed as a sort of solid Republican is like, hey, I'm an independent, why aren't you coming to my house? And we, it's a big mixing bowl on the ground right now with political affiliation, given that both parties are having a bit of a moment on their identity. Um, and so um, we, we just, we started our, our, what's called snow boots on the ground. We started our, cam our field campaign in February because we needed to re-baseline and figure out who are we talking to and how are things changing. Um, and you know, there's nothing quite as interesting as when you go into a red Republican area and you find a, a bunch of women standing around, you know, or sitting around talking about the garden club. They're all affiliated with the Republican party and you say, what's your, your number one issue? And they say cuts to Planned Parenthood. Okay. Something's happening, people. Like, it's changing. And so you got to be able to understand that and then go not leave any voter on the table who might be able to be convinced if you knock on their door. That's great. Um, so we are out of time. Thank you so much to Third Way for hosting this panel. Let's give these ladies a round of applause.
Um, thank you for doing the bravest thing you can do in our democracy and putting your name on the ballot. Thanks for running.